Amen, amen, amen. Today I'm going to be talking to you about some very familiar topics uh, uh, and a familiar story. We'll be dealing with favor and appearance. Favor, you know how some people in the world have favor over others, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It'll, that'll be revealed in the message as well as appearance. You know how a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on appearance and stuff like that, but it's not about what we see. And it's not about the way we see. We don't want to see with our eyes. We want to see through them. Are you with me? We want to see through them, understanding what we see. We don't want to use our eyes to define exactly what we see. Because, you know, when we go before the, the magic show, the magician tricks us all day. We're right up there, and we can't see it. So we got to understand how God wants to use us. We'll be in the book of 1 Samuel today, chapter 16. We're also going to be going to uh, chapter 17 as well. We're going to be doing two chapters, but we're not going to read all the way through this. I'm going to highlight a few things, and you can just follow with me, and I'll bring you up to speed with uh, where we are. So with that being said, let me bring you up to speed since we're starting in chapter 16. Chapter 16. Before we get there, there's a king named Saul. Okay? Saul was a very tall and handsome man, had those Hollywood looks, you know. You know, and, and the kids, you know, you always say, you know, they said, have a stand up and smile, see if you had straight teeth. If you had straight teeth, and say, you go to Hollywood with those teeth. You had a Hollywood smile. Samuel stood a head above everyone. He was tall and handsome, okay? But the problem is Samuel was nothing the way, like God wanted him to be. Samuel was terrible. So to make a long story short, Samuel's out. He's terrible. And he's being tormented by this evil spirit now. So he's out. So Saul, Saul, I, I have a problem mixing that one up. Saul is terrible. So what God is doing, sending his prophet Samuel to Bethlehem to see Jesse and his sons. Because Samuel is going to anoint the man who's going to take Saul's place. Okay. So this is where we are right now in uh, verse 16. We'll be starting in uh, chapter, uh, verse 6. Let's start it in verse 6. Like I said, we're just going to highlight a few things. And then I'll, I'll read it and then we'll go from there. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass by, pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So when he sent and had him brought in, he was ready with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the oil, took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Okay. Amen. What, what I didn't tell you is that Saul is not aware that Samuel's going to anoint someone else. But the other thing we need to look at in verses 6 and 7, we need to look at even the man of God, the prophet. What does he see? The prophet, he's assuming that Eliab, the first son, is the one because of his appearance. He's big, he's strong, he looks like a soldier. Even the man of God has gotten it wrong. This 
And this happens to us all because on Sunday we're here in church. We all, we all look fine. We're on our best behavior. Don't curse in church. We do all that little stuff. But now during the week, the world can have its way on you. The world is attacking us with sensory overload. And sometimes we start looking at things through the world's standard instead of through God's standard. And that's what's happening right here. The prophet has now allowed the world to change the way he's viewed. He's on the world's standard. We have to function on God's standard. Amen? This is what we got to do. We got to function on God's standard. So with that being said, it just blows my mind for us to allow a dirty, corrupt, unjust, terrible society dictate to us what style is, what beauty is. Because, see, everybody in here is kind of in style, kind of close. You may not be all the way on point, but you know you're working your way to that. <laughs> you know, that, look at it. We like sheep. We have bell bottoms one, one season. Next man, we got the skinny jeans. I mean, it just goes back and back and back. Baggy jeans. We wear them pants high, low. We, this, is the, this is what we're doing. We're allowing the world and someone else to dictate to us the standard. We have to understand who we are and allow God to dictate the standard. I mean, there are businesses that spend millions of dollars to trick you with schemes. Are you hearing me? With schemes. And we said, the Bible says we need to be aware of the devil's schemes. You know, because we get tricked. Have you ever been to Costco? Ever been, ever been to Costco on a weekend? Man, they're handing out that free food. Man, you, got, you could have a full meal at Costco. <laughs> and, and don't get in the, the line where they got the steak. You know, the line of the steak is longer than the line at the register. I mean, because, but this is what we do. But understand, this is a trick. It's a trick. And, and the, the, trick, the term that they use in the sales force for using this trick is called reciprocity with the principle that them giving you something for free will compel you to buy something. And we know it works because you come home with 50 pounds of that sausage that tastes like cornflakes, and you're like, <laughs> well, it tastes good in the store. I mean, but how did I get it? I mean, it, you can't even give it away. I mean, but this, this is, I mean, they saw all kind of little tricks they got. You know, ladies, they got in the department stores. You know, you go in there, you get the earrings. If you buy the earrings, which don't look that good, but you get the bracelet for free. So I don't really like the earrings, but I like this bracelet. I give this bracelet, this ring to my si- earrings to my sister or somebody. <laughs> you know, so act like you're giving a gift. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they, all the games. It's, these are tricks that the world plays on us all the time. And if you stay up late night, you see it too. The one, the, the scarcity tactic, the one they call scarcity. You know, you're looking at TV and say, "Hurry right now, while supplies last." <laughs> you know, get this. You know, and then you know, hey. And the first 100 callers, and then you know the first 100. I want to be, I want to be in that 100. I want to be the first 100 callers. Get, you know, this, these are the games we play. These are the games. But, but you got to understand that there is a solution to stuff like this. The solution is if you're saved, you go to Jesus Christ. If you're wrestling with this, you say, Lord, I need you to calm me down right now. I'm getting a little outside of myself, Lord. I need you to bring me back and put me back on the standard that you want me on. I need you to do, and, and you just, that's all you do, and the Lord will calm you down. That's what he does. He, he wants to be involved. Understand that. He want, in fact, in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, it tells us that he wants to be involved. And it lets us know the weapons we fight are not weapons of the world, or not with weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Amen. That's what we have to do. Take captive every thought. You know, you you kids, I mean, I know you're young. You got to understand you have to fight for your mind. You have to fight for your sanity. Every day you got to fight for it. I mean, they're attacking your kids, pop-ups on the phone. It's no way for, them to, for you to be at every place at every time. You have to teach your kids to train them up in the way to go. And that's what this gospel 
teach them to follow this word, and that's the defense against all of that nonsense that's coming against them and that's coming against us. Because you've got to fight for your mind. I mean, even us, you know, you sit down and, and get idle, and then before you know it, you're like, oh, my goodness. What was I just thinking? That's foolish. Lord, take that away from me. This is a war. This is a war. Satan doesn't sleep. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't rest. My brother Amani used to say he has the best work ethic of all. He's always on the job. What are you going to do? We got to be on the job. This is what the prayer is for. This is what all these people are for. Amen. Amen. The, the Hebrews understand one thing, that your heart has to be right to do this. Our heart has to be right. See, because look at this man of God. The man of God is being checked by God, and God needs to check us sometimes. But, but the problem is he's looking at the outward appearance. You know how you ladies look at all the buff guys? You say, oh, I'm not looking at him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and the guys the same, reverse. But, I mean, but this is the hang-up. You can't look at that and think that's a good woman. We can't get caught up in that. You know, because all those supermodels, all that, I've seen prettier people in person than I've seen on the runway. I guarantee you, you look around. There's some beautiful people around here, and they look far better. And we cannot get caught up in that. We can't, we got to force ourselves to deal with our heart because that's where the truth is. This is where your truth is. And the Hebrews had, a, had the concept of the heart, whereas to, they believed that the heart embodied all of the intellect, all of the will, and all of your desires so that your life will reflect what's in your heart. All right? That's how we have to be. That's a great thing to embody. That's how we got to do. And even Christians got to check in with God from time to time. Now, let's go deal with the anointing. Like I said, we're going to be jumping around. A little bit, and I'm going to chap, uh, verse 11 now. Let's look at verse 11, talking about the anointing. Verse 11 through 13. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? This, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in, and he was ruddy, which means he was kind of short, stocky. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, <laughs> and handsome features. <laughs> then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. <laughs> so Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in his presence of his brothers. From that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Then Samuel went to Ramah. So this is, I'm saying all that to say this. Don't get upset if the world doesn't choose you. Hmm? Look, but you look at this because David's daddy didn't even choose him. He brought seven other brothers in before him. And, and you don't see David huffing and puffing, getting mad. He's not angry. He's not doing anything. He just said, he, okay, he came in. What is David doing? What is David doing? What is he doing? He's out taking care of his business. And, but the thing is, they said they anointed him. Do we understand what that means, to anoint? Anoint means to pour out to smear, to rub in. That's, what, that's, that's the, symbol, the symbol of the Holy Spirit. So it, it's, it's like when you put on that good lotion and you rub it all in, and the, and the idea is that it covers your entire body. The Holy Spirit covers you entirely, so you are fully blessed. That's what we got to understand. See, and that, that's what we got to understand. But, but look at David. David, he, he's, he's not acting up. Because it's in Bethlehem, man. I don't know. It couldn't have been too much to do in Bethlehem. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? I'm going to tend the sheep. I'll be milking the cows. Uh, I'm going to plow the land. What are you going to do? Uh, and after that, you're tired. <laughs> it's not much to do. So when the man of God came to town, he had to know that the man of God was in town. He had to know that. It's a small town. He had to know that. But what is David doing? <laughs> David is out tending the sheep, being the best possible shepherd he can be. See, look at how, how beautiful God is. God, we're talking about the heart, but look at God is revealing David's heart to us. These are glimpses at David's heart. That's what this is all about, understanding, focusing on what, what it is to do. And this is a good teaching moment for us because some of us are in seasons when things aren't going the way we want them to go. Amen? 
Some of us are in seasons with a job that's just dead in. It's terrible. I don't want it, but I prayed for it. I got it, but you know, Lord, can you get me out? Because <laughs> it's not what I thought it was going to be. I mean, th- but this, some of us are in these spots. This, this is common. This happens. But the point is, we got to stick to our guns, stay focused on God, do what we're supposed to do without grumbling. So when the Lord removes us and takes us out of this place, those people will miss you. And they'll realize exactly how good you are, something that God knew already from the beginning and most of your friends and family. That's how we got to conduct ourselves. We got to do it. David's not starstruck knowing that Samuel's there. He's not phased by any of that. He's still doing what he's supposed to do. Man, he's humble. He's humble. Because when you look at the text, it said he did this, that Samuel did this in front of his brothers. He's the baby boy. Baby boy don't have no respect. <laughs> you know, the baby boy doesn't get the respect. He, and David doesn't disrupt the pecking order. He doesn't stop doing his chores. David stays focused on what he's supposed to do. This is the type of heart David has. This is the type of heart we got to have or allow the Lord to develop in us. All right? This this is what it's all about, humility. And and what's going on now? See, now David's doing this, but Saul is up there going crazy because the Spirit of the Lord has left Saul, King Saul. The Spirit, and he's he's going crazy. So as people are looking around, they say, what can we do? We're going to go get somebody who plays music to calm you down because you're acting a little outside yourself, kid. So what do they do? Who plays music? David. David plays music. So he comes and plays for Samuel. Samuel's pl- uh, Saul. Saul is pleased with him, and he has him there, makes him one of his armor bearers. That's like a personal aid. Man, so that's, that's, that's favor. That's the type of favor God will do. One minute he's out stepping in sheep, doo-doo, and the next minute he's in the (laughs) palace with new shoes. (laughs) Feet clean, not stinking. (laughs) He's all cleaned up. That's what God wants to do with us, pull us out of that stink and bring us in there. That's what God is trying to do to you all the time. Trying to get that stuff you, trying to get it off your shoe, okay? Hey, God wants to do that. And you got to be mindful because we have friends and we got family members who sometimes try to get us to go in the wrong direction in an unfavorable way that's not legal. And they say, you know, and then they, tell, and then they try to justify it by saying, well, you, you don't want to do that because that's, that's too hard. It's too hard for you to go that way. You don't want to do that. But that's a worldly standard. They don't know the type of God we serve. Hey, we serve a God who's in the business of making miracles happen. We serve a God who's in the business of breakthroughs. We serve a God who's in the business of making the impossible possible. That's what I'm talking about. And if you don't believe me, you can just ask some of these people around you right now. You sit next to miracles and you don't even know it. You really don't even realize how. Just sit down and talk to some of your members. Ask, ask my brother Joe. What about a miracle? That he's here. Ask my brother Joe. Ask, ask Aaron. Ask, ask the carpenters about the miracles that's taking place in their lives that they can attest to. It's not a fairy tale. You can ask my wife. You could ask me. You could ask Tanika Small. I don't know, many of you may know Tanika Small. Tanika Small is in Marin City, goes to PICF. She was a passenger on a Golden Gate Transit bus. The driver, on 101, the driver dies. Just before he fully died, he was able to pull over and stop the bus. With bus full of people. Some people, you think that's a coincidence? You think that's some type of, oh, well, she had a lucky shirt on or whatever. No. This is God at work. Marcus Small, her uncle, one of my best friends, in 1989, you remember the earthquake, Loma Prieta? He just went across to Cyprus. After he goes across it, the Cyprus collapses. He's saved. That's the type of God that we serve. That's what happens when you put God first and foremost. Amen? This is the type of God. That's what it's all about. Do you understand? You understand the cross? Jesus died, buried for three days, 
and rose again. That's the miracle. There's nobody else is doing that. Nobody. So you serve a God like that. You got to understand the kind of power that he has available to you. This is what's available. You have to believe it. You got to know it. Place God first. That's what it's all about. And have the right motives and the right blessings. And in fact, look at Job 22, 21. Can we go there real quick? Job 22, 21 tells you these are, these are just ways, avenues, how to get this type of favor that we're talking about. And we got to understand the favor that we're talking about is a layman term. In the church, we know this as grace. This is grace. Call a blessing. This is grace. Unmerited favor. Nothing that we did, but what God does for us. Favor. That's what it's all about. Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. And even Proverbs eleven twenty five: 25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Amen. Proverbs 21, 21, whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. That's the type of God we serve. That's the type of God we serve. Now we're going to move on. Let's move on to chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17 Verses 4 through 11. I'm going to bring you up to speed and introduce you to this guy. Uh, yeah, chapter 4. First, cha- First Samuel, chapter 17, verses 4 through 11. A champion named Goliath was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That's about 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. The spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. That's about 15 pounds. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. (laughs) Terrified. Dismayed and terrified. These are Israel's fighting men. They're dismayed and terrified. Huh. And if you look further down in verse 16, you'll see this has been going on for 40 days. Every morning when they wake up and before they go to sleep, Goliath come out and give that shout out. And talk crazy. All, it's for 40 days now. that they got, And this is, the, this is ridiculous. Let me, let me bring you up to speed on, on this. Because this, this is, when Saul is out, fighting like he's done now. And this is going to be the little de-hunt translation, so if it's not quite right, do yourself a favor this week and read 1 Samuel 16 and 1 Samuel 17, because I'm going to put it up in a little modern-day vernacular. (laughs) So, Saul. When Saul's out fighting, David would go between the two. When, when, When Saul goes out, David goes back to his dad's and helps his dad with the sheep. On this particular day, his dad asked him, say, hey, son, I need you to take some roasted grain up to your brothers and some uh, loaves of bread. Would you do that for me? And, and take 10 cheeses up to the head, the commander of the unit. David, no problem, no problem. I guess he's probably tired of sheep, uh, doing those, can't, doing with them sheep anyway. So they run on up there. They run, he run, David gets up there. As soon as he gets in the camp, he sees part of the regiment going out. They shouting, They're giving a war cry. David, you know, feeling good, all right. I'm in the right spot. He sees the supply guy. 
He sees his brother. He gives his supplies over to the guy. Gives the supplies to the guy. So he's going to greet his brothers now. Right as he's going over here to greet his brothers, guess who comes out? Goliath. Shouting, talking crazy. And it, I, mean, I mean, just outside. And if you look, and when he shouted this time, Saul wasn't with him. In verse 24, he said, when the Israel saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. This is blowing David's mind. They all ran. Because now David, un, now look at, look at what's going on. David's down here believing and everybody else in town that, that my Israel, our soldiers up here battling. It's going on hot and heavy. It's a knockdown, drag out war. They're going at it. Now he sees these guys running. They run. They run from Goliath. And then so they all run and they're huddled up and they're talking. They're talking about Goliath. And, and uh, David comes in. He's seeing what's going on. He greets his brothers and he hears them saying what the king is going to do for the one who kills this Philistine. He said he's going to offer him great wealth. Going to, going to give him his daughter in marriage. On top of all of that, your family will never have to pay taxes again. Woo! <laughs> David, David, he, he, do, he, uh, he had one of these. But look at what happens. This older brother, who the world had so much favor for, Samuel had favor for, overhears the conversation. Looks at the little brother asking, what you doing up here? What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be back home tending with those sheep? And he's like, man, what, what, you know, what's going on? You, know, you don't even know that I just brought you something. You know, but the, you know what's happening here. This is the baby boy who's seeing the older brother, who I'm sure was, was putting hands on all of the, the brothers, when need be. He's seeing him afraid. It's the first he's seeing, and his brother, his older brother's a little bit embarrassed. And he's really just trying to shoo him on out of there. So they exchange words back and forth. David, ah, okay, whatever. And he goes back talking to the guys to hear more about this reward, make sure he gets it all right. But in the meantime, somebody overhears the conversation David had with Eliab and these guys, and they go report it to Saul. You know, Saul's back there getting some fresh undergarments or something because uh, he just <laughs> sold himself. <laughs> he, he back there. So, so Saul summons David. <laughs> Saul summons David. David comes in. He's like, hey, what's going on, King? He said, well, I, gotta, I want to talk to you about some things. He, and David's like, you know what? I want to talk to you about some things, too. Uh, he said, uh, you know this big Philistine they got out there making all that noise, talking crazy, talking bad to us? I want to tell you, I'm not scared of him. Matter of fact, if you send me, you know what the next thing you're going to hear is timber. It's going to be the sound of a big nine-foot tree named Goliath going down. Send me. I'm ready, king. I'm fired up. And David's pumped up, fired up. And remember now, Saul is a tall guy. So he's looking at him kind of, you know, come on, little guy. Calm, little fella. <laughs> Calm yourself down. I know, you, I know you're kind of anxious to get out there, man. But look, let me tell you something, man. You're just a boy. You're just a boy. This guy has been a fighting man ever since his youth. David was like, King, let me tell you something. <laughs> let me break it down for you, King, so you know who I am, because I know you see me around here, and I'm being polite, and I'm being nice, and I'm being mannerable, and I'm doing all that stuff. But you know that when you're on the battlefield, I go back and tend sheep with my dad, okay? While I was tending sheep one day, a lion came, took the sheep. You know what happened? I grabbed him, the sheep from the lion's mouth, and I put these things on him. <laughs> I put these things on him and killed him. Killed him. The same thing, a bear came up. And I rescued the sheep from the bear. And I put these do rights on him again. And, and I know that it's the Lord who did that for me. The Lord who delivered me from the lion and the bear will also deliver me from this Philistine. This Philistine will be just like the lion and the bear. Send me. And King's whole, his whole demeanor changed. You know, he got on his clean undergarments. He's like, it was looking bad. Now it's looking good. He's ready to do the king's step, everything. He's ready. <laughs> the king is fired up. He said, well, look here, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not fighting anymore, so you can take my armor. <laughs> I won't be out there today, <laughs> so why don't you take my stuff? <laughs> he said, they said oh, <laughs> okay, okay, king, I'll take it. But he, he tries it on. He tries it on, but it's a little bulky. It's kind of weighing him down. Saul is a big guy, probably six, 
a hundred or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> 60. You know, he's a, he's a tall guy. So, and, and, it, and it doesn't fit David. And David's like, you know, no, 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 I, I got to tell you this. Say, King, look, if I go out here and fight him, I got to be me. I have to be me. And that's what it's all about, everybody. When you go out in this world, you got to be you. If you're going to win this war, you got to be you. You can't go out here being a wannabe or being somebody else. You got to be you. God has made you special. You got to know who you are. David knows who he is. It's important for us to know exactly who we are. You understand what I'm saying? You got to know who you are. That's what it's all about. See, and, 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 and the beautiful thing about this is David acknowledges that he didn't kill the bear. He didn't kill the lion. But it's the living God who killed the lion. That's what we need to know. And, that, and that's what it's all about, acknowledging who God is. That's what it's all about. We have to know. Because Saul's back there sipping on his latte. But look at 2 Peter 1 and 3. This, this gives us an insight of who we are. 2 Peter 1 Chapter 1, verses 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Amen? That's what it's all about. So that, what's that saying is that the knowledge of God is going to make me better able to navigate through this life. The knowledge of God. It's not... No, it's not Hearing about him is about knowing him. Yeah. A lot of people play the game and they read, but, but you really don't know him. You have to know him. You yourself have to know him personally. Nobody can stand in your place on judgment day. Your mama, your brother, nobody. It's you. Amen. It's you. We got to know exactly who this guy is. We got to do that. Man, man. And, and the, the, beauty, the beauty of that is when you submit yourself to God, you have to give him all access because he loves you so much. He will not trespass on a place that you don't want him to come into. He'll let you hang on to that foolishness as long as you want to because it's not going to take you anywhere you want to be until you come to the understanding that I need to get rid of this. Lord, I need you in my life in this part. We have to be submissive. God wants unrestricted access to you. That's what he wants. For you. And that's what we have to seek for ourselves and be honest with ourselves. Because when you're talking to God, it's just you and God. It's nobody else in that conversation. It's just you and him. It's an A and B conversation. And Satan can see his way out of it. Okay? All right. See, because what we got to do is we have to let God grow us. We got to let God grow us. If you were a thief, let God show you how to steal Satan's glory. All right? That's if you're a thief. If you, if you sold shoes, let God show you how to win souls for him. That's what God wants for us. That's what, God is, that's what it's all about. If you're a fighter, let God show you how to make and fight the good fight. If you're a hustler, if you're a pusher, let him show you how to push this gospel, how to move this gospel, how to get it in all of those little areas that nobody else wants to be into. Let him show you how to use you. Because everybody in here is crafted and done, made differently. We're all designed to put up and tolerate different things. What you can tolerate, I can't tolerate. What you can do, I can't do. Only you can do. Understand how special and how important you are. You are a royal priesthood, a holy family. It's you. You have to understand your value. Don't let the world tell you who they think you are. They're not qualified to judge you. Amen? They're not. They're not qualified for that. They're not. Amen. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't. Look at the apostles. If you're not reading your Bible, look at the apostles' lives. Look at where they came from. Murderers. Paul was a murderer. You got, he did a lot of rough things, terrible things. You can look at, look at the tax collectors. Tax collectors were not nice guys. They come turn you upside down in front of your wife and kids, go into your pocket, wife and the kids' pocket. Everybody. This is what they did. We got to understand how God changed them, and you think he can't change you? He can. He's able. God is able. It doesn't matter. Now, let's, 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 get to, let's wrap this up right here and get to uh, 
verse 41 through 50 in chapter 17. Let's see how this is going to go. Let's see how it's going to go. Are we there? All right. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give you the Give the carcass of the Philistines army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that this, that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Amen. 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 You got to know something. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. In this particular instance, he's coming to steal the identity. He stole the identity of the Israelites. They have forgotten who they worship. They have forgotten who they are. You cannot afford to forget who you are. You have to be mindful of exactly who you are. Don't let them trick you. I don't care what they told you when you were young. Get rid of all of that nonsense, what they teased you about, all of that foolishness. Get rid of it. In Christ, you are a new creation. You don't hold on to the nonsense. You got to let it go. You're brand new today. Let God show you who you are. You're royalty. You're royalty. You look and you when I say it, you don't sound like you believe it. You are royalty. If God is king of kings and you are the heirs, you are royalty. And when you know you're royalty, you conduct yourself in a different manner. You respond in a different manner. Look at all these kings around here, the kings and queens. When they speak, they're mindful of what they say. They're really careful so it doesn't get blown out of proportion. You have, that's why it says, season everything you say with salt. So it's going out specifically to meet the purpose that you're designed to be there for. You have to know that. Don't you want to be one of these people with this favor? The favor that God has. Don't you want to be one of these? Well, know this. The same God who gave him the favor is the same God who offers the favor to you. All you have to do is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. <clears throat> That's all you have to do. It's easy to accept him as Savior, but accept him as your Lord. Accept him as someone who's going to lead you as the king and the God of who he is, who has never been wrong in some things he can't do and lie is one of them. He'll never lie to you. <clears throat> He's the one who you want to lead your life. He's all-knowing. He's all powerful. He has it all in his hands. Let us bow our heads.